My name is Cindy Sanders and welcome to Food Checkout Week. I am the UF FIFAS Extension Director and I'm going to introduce to you some of our other agents here in our office in Alachua County. Martha Maddox is our Family Consumer Science Agent. Dr. Tatiana Sanchez is our Commercial Horticulture Agent. And Dr. Kevin Corris is our Ag and Natural Resource Agent. We're here today to talk to you a little bit about the Food Checkout Week that's sponsored by Florida Farm Bureau. Every, every year in February, Farm Bureau sponsors a Food Checkout Week. And the reason behind it is it's a time to celebrate the abundance of fresh food as well as nutritious food uh, here, not only in Lachua County, but in the state of Florida. The average American household spends less than 10% of their income on food. And I always want to stress that in the United States, we have not only uh, the safest, but most abundant food supply. Alachua County Agriculture actually is a $255 million value added impact to the citizens of Alachua County. So I always tell everybody, you have to get outside of Gainesville to see the agricultural production in Alachua County. So at this time, I'm gonna call on my fellow agents to talk to you a little bit about some products that are grown here in Alachua County and also tell us the nutrition value um, of those products as well as perhaps maybe how to use those products in your home. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Tatiana Sanchez, our commercial horticulture agent. Thank you, Cindy. Okay, thank you, Cindy. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Tatiana Sanchez, commercial horticulture agent for Alachua County uh, from UFIFAS Extension. I work directly with vegetable and fruit producers, as well as nurseries and landscape professionals. One of the main responsibilities um, that I have is to deliver education um, that will provide the production of, uh, that will improve the production of commodities grown in the county. One of the commodities with higher acreage in our county is watermelon. And since this crop is so important for our area, today we're going to discuss how it is produced and the role of UFI as extension in helping growers. The state of Florida is an important player in watermelon production nationwide. Just in Florida, about 25,500 acres are planted in watermelon each year. Although a lot of it is planted in South Florida, about one third is grown in the Suwannee Valley area or region, including Alachua County. So everybody is familiar with watermelons, but how much do you know about them? Um, watermelon seeds have been found from as far back as 5,000 years ago. Watermelons could remain edible for weeks or even months if kept in a cool, shaded area. Um, so watermelons, although tasteless back then, was used as a water source for the dry season or for long trips. Although wild watermelons were domesticated for water and food in Northeastern Africa over 4,000 years ago, it wasn't until about 2,000 years ago in the Mediterranean that this fruit emerged uh, as a sweet dessert. However, this fruit uh, not always looked or tasted the same as it does today. Wild watermelons were originally watery but had a hard texture with a pale flesh color and it was either bland or bitter. So it has come a long way. Um, the watermelon plant is a vine and it has separate flowers. In the picture on the left, you can see uh, that the female, sorry, that male flowers develop first. So the pollen is available when the female flower opens and is receptive to pollen. Um, in order to get fertilized, watermelons rely on pollinators such as honeybees. Um, so you will always see honey beehives along the fences of watermelon fields. And this is to ensure pollination and productivity of the crop. Um, you may wonder, how is it that when you were growing up, you used to spit watermelon seeds, whereas now uh, most watermelon in the market is actually seedless. So 
Watermelon is naturally a diploid plant, meaning they have two sets of chromosomes, just like we do. And so during cell division, breeders um, treat the diploid watermelon with a substance called colchicine. And so that substance enables the duplication of the number of chromosomes resulting in a tetraploid plant, meaning they have four sets of chromosomes. Um, when crossing them with a regular watermelon plant, then the resulting plant only has one and a half, sorry, it has one and a half times the number of, of normal chromosomes. So in other words, you end up with a triploid plant. And because they have an odd number of chromosomes, then they cannot form viable seed. And that's how we end up with seedless watermelon. Um, in, now, watermelon is growing around us here in Alachua County. How do they do this? About 1,000 acres are planted each year in the county, including High Springs, um, Newberry, Alachua, and Gainesville. The fields are prepared during February to have everything ready for planting. The field preparation includes forming raised beds that are covered with plastic mulch. Underneath that plastic, a tape of drip irrigation is located at the center of the bed to provide water throughout the season. Um, in addition, an initial amount of granular fertilizer is placed while the bed is being formed to provide nutrients to the crop. Uh, further applications of fertilizers are made through the season uh, or later in the season by using the drip irrigation system. And this is called fertigation. Um, planting starts in early March and harvest goes from late May to July. Um, watermelons are typically started as transplants in greenhouses. These greenhouses are typically located either in South Florida or Georgia. And after growing them for about five to six weeks, the transplants are taken into the fields that have been previously prepared. You can see on the picture on the right, a watermelon field. You can see the uh, raised beds covered with plastic mulch and the grow habit of the watermelon plants. Um, these rows are spaced at about eight feet. And then the plants are spaced anywhere between 2.5 to three feet um, apart within each row. So during the watermelon season, weekly updates are shared with our growers to keep them updated on nutrient, pest and disease management recommendations. And we do this with a regional approach. So that regional approach is um, something that all of the extension agency in the Swanee Watermelon region do so we can uh, inform our growers of what's happening, not only within their counties, but also in the surrounding counties. Um, I also visit farm fields on a weekly basis to monitor for nutrient levels, pests and diseases, to have an accurate diagnosis of problems and recommend timely solutions. So during these weekly visits, besides scouting the fields, I collect the most recently mature leaf in about 20 plants per acre to measure the nutrient levels in the sap of the plants. So you can see um, what the most recently mature leaf looks like on the picture on the right of the screen. And so from these type of leaves, what I do is I remove the blade of the leaf and, and keep only the petiole. So the petiole is like this stem of the leaf. So once I have collected like, uh, like a number of petioles, then I extract the sap and using probes, I measure the levels of nitrogen and potassium that are in those petioles. So by collecting nutrient levels within the plant uh, during the season, growers can fine tune fertilizer applications to avoid excess application of nutrients and meet the crop uh, nutrient requirements. At the end of the site visit, I meet with the farm uh, manager or with the grower, and I discuss with him observations and recommendations. Um, on occasions, I collect samples that are collected for further diagnosis on either nutrient and 
test management issues, submit them to the lab and subsequently follow up with the growers with recommendations. So this is how I, so far I've told you about how do we grow it. So now we're hitting the end of the season, uh, which is harvesting time. It takes a lot of work to harvest a field of watermelon. Most watermelon producers contract migrant labor to complete this task. Um, the agricultural workers typically start in the southern of the state and then they move their way up north um, and north of the state as the fields become ready for harvest. During May and June, you have probably seen many school buses without windows um, driving around county roads. And these are the vehicles typically used to move fruit from the fields to the packing sheds. So the fruit is brought into the packing shed, they're rinsed, and then they're sorted by size and shipped out. So a survey conducted to watermelon growers in the service region, as well as um, representatives of the allied industry, uh, gave us some information of what happened uh, within the last watermelon season. 92% uh, of respondents indicated that UFIFS extension services are an important part of their operation and contribute significantly to their economic success. 48% of them qualify for the economic benefit received to be in the range of uh, 50 to $200 per acre, and an additional 20% of them qualified for the economic benefit uh, received to be over $200 per acre. On average, our clientele used at least three services provided by extension, with the highest ranked being one-on-one -on -one consultation within, with county faculty, uh, SAP testing, and consultation with regional specialized agents. Um, and, you know, well, despite the current pandemic and all the challenges that came with it, 73% of our producers, our producers reported an excellent watermelon season. They expressed gratitude towards extension agents as we continue to support them through the uncertainty and limitations associated with COVID-19. So I want to invite you to support local growers of watermelon and any of the other commodities produced in the county. You can always search for the label fresh from Florida or ask your store for local produce. And every year uh, you can also participate in the new Berry Watermelon Festival. Um, this year is going to be on Saturday, May 15. So I want to invite you to it. And with that, um, now, what do we know about the nutritional properties of watermelon? And here is when I want to introduce our next speaker, Martha Maddox. Thank you. Thank you, Tantiana. I'm Martha Maddox. I'm the Family Consumer Science Agent here in Alachua County with UFIFAS Extension. And what I'm going to do today is talk to you about the nutritional value, how to practice good food safety guidelines, and how to use the different products uh, that we buy locally. What are the nutritive values of watermelon? Well, watermelons are 92% water, which means that is a very good source for hydration, especially during the summertime. Uh, there's nothing better than a cool slice of watermelon. And if you do not like to drink a lot of water, you can uh, eat a lot of watermelon. But I'm going to tell you this, if you're diabetic, you need to be very careful because watermelon is full of natural sugars, which will run your glu uh, glucose level up. Also, watermelons are fat free, they're sodium free, and they're cholesterol free. Now we're going to get into a minute talking about different enhanced flavor enhancers. And if you reach for the sodium, and this is the only time that I've probably reached for the sodium on something, is I grew up eating salt on watermelon. And when you do that, it is not sodium free. So keep that in mind. Uh, watermelons are a good source of vitamin C, vitamin A, and they're a good source of lipin. 
Uh, these are antioxidants that help prevent the body against heart disease, inflammation, and some cancers. So watermelon is a good nutritional fruit to eat. If you have about two cups of watermelon, it has about 80 calories in it. Again, we talked it's 92% water. It has 8%, and this is based on a two-cup serving. It has 8% of vitamin A, 6% vitamin B6, 25% vitamin C, 6% potassium, 6% manganese, and 6% magnesium. It has 8% thiamine, 2% phosphorus, 12.7% lipine, and it is sodium-free, fat-free, and cholesterol-free. So as you can see, watermelon is a good, nutritious choice when you're looking at a fruit choice. Now you're going to the grocery store and you're getting ready to buy your food. Uh, we want to know how to prepare it and how to store it. So when you go to select your watermelon, like Tantiana was talking about in the fields, a watermelon will lay on the ground. And when you're looking at the watermelons, if they have a yellow, creamy ground spots, what it's called, on that watermelon, that's a good indication that that watermelon is ripe. However, if there is not a creamy yellow ground spot, it's just green or white, that means the watermelon probably is not ripe. So you want to try to look for a riper watermelon that is green and yeah, has your yellow and uh, your cream colored ground spot. Now, when you get home, before you put it in the refrigerator to uh, chill, or especially before you slice it, you want to wipe the outside of the watermelon off with a clean cloth that has a little bit of slightly soapy water and then wash that off with clean water. The reason you're doing this is to prevent cross contamination. Because when you take that knife and you cut down through that skin, any bacteria, germs, dirt, whatever is on the outside of that skin will go into the flesh of your watermelon and you will eat it. So once you've cut your watermelon, you want to place it in the refrigerator. Now you can place it in the refrigerator hole and make sure you put uh, some uh, plastic wrap or uh, foil around it. Or you can take and you can take it out of the shell and put it in a container and seal it up. Once you've put it in the refrigerator after you've cut it, it would normally store no longer than one week. Now let's talk about cooking. Did you ever think about cooking a watermelon? Most times people say, oh, I'm just going to eat a slice of watermelon. Well, it is great to enjoy just a delicious fresh slice of watermelon. Also, you can enhance the flavor of that sweet, juicy watermelon with salt or pepper or both, chopped mint, goat cheese. You can take and brush that slice of watermelon or wedge of watermelon with any flavor of olive oil or balsamic vinegar and throw it on a very hot grill. Make sure your grill is hot. If it is lukewarm, it will not sear. You're wanting, uh, when you throw that watermelon slice on the grill, you're wanting it to have grill marks immediately. So it needs to be very hot, the grill does. Uh, you can also drizzle honey over your watermelon, or you can take and slice it and put it in a salad with citrus vinaigrettes. So now that leads us to how do we eat watermelon? Tatiana, did you ever think about having watermelon as a pizza? No, not really. <laughs> well, I never either. But one of the things that you can do is take and cut a round piece of watermelon. You can put cream cheese, you can put ham, tomatoes, you can put everything, you know, you just use your imagination. Now, last summer I was doing a 4-H camp and I come across this and I tried it. Dr. Sanders, what I know you love bacon and lettuce tomatoes, your BLT. What about a watermelon bacon lettuce sandwich? Substitute the tomato for with the watermelon. You game? A BLW. 
It sounds interesting. It's very good. It has become one of my favorite and I can't wait to get watermelon season again. This is a real good one for uh, if you've got grandkids or kids or you're entertaining watermelon kebabs with a piece of mozzarella cheese with chocolate and mint. That is really good. Here is the grilled watermelon that I talked about. You want to make sure you brush it with a little uh, extra virgin olive oil or your balsamic vinegars and put it on that hot grill and it uses grill marks. You can also take and cut the watermelon out of the rind and you can frost it with a cream cheese icing and put strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, all kinds of things. Or a watermelon ice cream sandwich. Cut a wedge, holler it out in the middle and put your favorite ice cream in it. The last three are probably some of my favorite other than the BLT. And that goes back up here to a salad. There's nothing better than a watermelon, blueberry, strawberry salad with feta cheese and mint. It is, it, it's phenomenal. Also, I, I love my salmon and I love to make a watermelon salsa with watermelon, avocados and feta cheese and let that set for at least an hour to marinate and put it over the salmon. And in the morning, a great smoothie with some mint in the blender, watermelon in the blender, kiwi in the blender, blend it up. You can even throw some fat-free yogurt in there and you're ready to go. Now then, you really want a great snack for your kids or just for yourself. Experiment with watermelon popsicles kiwi and watermelon, watermelon, blueberries, blackberries, just plain old watermelon, watermelon, strawberry, watermelon, cherry, vanilla, and pistachio ice cream popsicles. Put a little ice cream in there, pistachio ice cream, and then do this or your watermelon and mint. You do not have to have professional watermelon um, cylinders to put it in. These are made in just some little cups uh, that you have in stock. So now then, you know the nutritional value of watermelon, how to prepare it safely, and a few recipes. If you have any more questions, you can contact me at the Alachua County Extension Office. But I'm going to tell you like Tantiana did, I strongly encourage you to support our local farmers and our local growers and our local farmers markets. Go out and buy local and enjoy the delicious, fresh, Alachua County and Florida watermelons. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kevin Corliss, who's going to talk to us about peanuts. Hello, my name is Kevin Corliss, and I am the Agricultural Row Crop Extension Agent for Alachua County. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I sure want some watermelon popsicles now after seeing that presentation. Those look delicious. It's after lunch. It's time for a dessert. Um, but uh, Actually, now we're going we're gonna to steer away from the fruits and we're going to talk about something else, the nuts, right? We're going to talk about peanut production in Florida. Um, and so many of you may not even know that there is peanut production in Florida, but the southeast is uh, one of the larger areas in the U.S. that has uh, peanut production, mostly due to our sandy soils. Um, you know, um, I didn't realize until I moved down to Florida uh, several years back that peanuts actually grow and develop underground. Um, which is which is quite crazy. So they need kind of a looser soil to be able to grow and, and turn into a peanut. Um, so sand works really well um, for growing peanuts. So first, let's just take a look at what the heck a peanut plant is. Um, so here is basically the anatomy of a peanut plant. Um, they have a compound leaf. So they actually have, um, it's not a trifoliate, I guess you'd call it a quadfoliate because there's actually four leaflets per leaf. So what you're seeing here is an actual leaflet. Um, and then it has these kind of pretty um, yellow flowers um, that will come out and bloom. And then from that flower, I will try to circle it there in red, you can see these um, pegs form. And they, pe they form from the same axle from which the flower was formed. And those pegs will eventually find their way down into the soil. And once they're in the soil, then they can actually produce the seed, that peanut that we eat. Um, so it's, it's very, very unique. You know, when, when you first pull up a peanut plant and you see all these fruits in its root system, you think it's like a potato um, where it's got maybe a swollen root system. Well, it's not like a potato at all. A potato is a vegetative part of that particular plant. 
And this is the reproductive part. Peanuts are the reproductive part of, of the peanut plant and they actually form underground, which is really, really unique. Um, but the flower flowers above ground and then sends that peg down to the soil to get covered up. Um, and so, yeah, and then we, we see the peanut that's formed. It's a dihiscent peanut. So it, it opens, um, there's two different cracks where it can open and then you find the two little seeds inside that we enjoy to eat or make peanut butter out of or whatever. I'll have Martha talk about that. So some peanut stats for um, the US and here in Florida. So um, these are, the first two stats are from 2020 and I forgot to put the little disclaimer here on this page, but all of these statistics come from the USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service, which is just online. Um, so these are all USDA numbers. So in the United States in 2020, there were 1,615,800 acres of peanuts planted. So that's quite a bit. Um, in Florida alone, um, we have 160,000 of those acres. And then in Alachua County, unfortunately, the, the last bit of data that I could find, um, or the most recent bit of data that I could find was from 2007. Um, so in 2007, we had about 3,400 acres of peanut. And that goes up and down just kind of based on the year, based on growers rotations and things like that. So that's pretty average for what we have here in Alachua County. So how does, how do, how do we cultivate peanuts? How does it work? So peanuts are planted by seed. Unlike um, watermelons, as Tatiana mentioned, since um, we develop seedless watermelons, you can't harvest the seeds to replant, right? Because they're seedless. So she showed you the pictures of the little baby plants that they had growing in the greenhouse. We have to take those baby plants and transplant them in the field. Not so with peanuts. Peanuts are planted by seed and they're usually drilled into the ground with this big plant planting equipment called a drill, a no-till drill. Um, so we'll drill them into the ground and that usually happens anywhere between April 25th to June 1st. Um, the reason there's a, a kind of a, a big gap in planting dates is just because of weather conditions, soil moisture, things like that, um, that we have to work around. Um, plus it just also kind of depends on the type and variety of peanut yet that you're looking to grow. Here in Florida, we pretty much grow one variety of peanut, Georgia 06G. Um, so there's not a lot of diversity in our, in our cultivar selection or our peanut variety selection here. Um, so our, our planting dates are typically in May for Florida, but uh, in the US in general, it's between April 25th and June 1st. Um, so we typically wanna shoot for about five to six seeds per row foot if you're doing a single row. But many of the growers uh, here in Florida have a twin drill. So they'll actually drill two rows right next to each other that are only a couple inches apart. Um, and if that happens, then of course your, your um, seeds per row is cut down by half because you have two rows. So we recommend three rows um, per foot. So that's, that's getting it planting, uh, getting it planted. So then the cultivation of the plant. So as you can see in this picture and in the last picture, um, there's a lot of space in between these rows, right? And before we plant our, our peanut seeds in the ground, we try to make sure we have a, a perfectly prepared seed bed. So nothing but clean, flat, even soil, right? So then we come along with our planter and put the seeds in the ground. And for the first, maybe even a couple of months that that plant is in the ground, there's a lot of space, as you can see. So when there's space and there's soil and there's sunshine and there's water, you're gonna have weeds, right? So weed control during establishment is very important for peanut production. Um, you wanna make sure that again, you have a weed-free clean bed so that the peanuts that you put in there have the, the highest chance of success in, in germinating and, and turning into adult plants. Um, water management um, is also very important with peanuts. It's usually something that we think about in, in the mid season. Um, early on, we don't, uh, we don't want to irrigate too much. Um, and it's, it's, we're still getting some rains um, during that time of the season. And then towards the end of the season, we also don't want to water too much either, um, especially after the peanut has basically, um, it's completed its uh, taking of the nutrients from the top of the plant. So it's going to send the sugars that it makes from the leaves through photosynthesis down into that peanut. And um, once that's done, uh, we, we, we no longer need to irrigate. But during the middle of the season, when it gets really hot and nasty, like it does here in Florida, we need to keep track of uh, where our moisture's at. And so that's one um, place where um, Alachua County Extension comes into play, or UFIFIS Extension, is we try to get out to growers and um, 
uh, put soil moisture sensors in their field so that they can see exactly where their soil water content is throughout the growing season and they can um, plan their irrigation uh, accordingly. Um, so then there's also two other things when cultivating peanuts, uh, insect control, which is a season long endeavor. Um, and there's many different types of uh, insects that attack peanut. Thrips are probably one of the biggest ones, um, but you also get spider mites and aphids and, and all sorts of other things. There's also these microscopic worms that live in the soil called nematodes that can actually feed on the peg and the seed pod itself, which can just weaken that peg. And when you pull the plant up, the seeds remain in the soil. So that's not good. And then of course we have a, a plethora of plant diseases that we deal with throughout the season. Um, mostly the fungal ones are, are the ones that give us uh, the most headache and the most grief, um, but there are some viral and even some bacterial diseases out there too that can, uh, can, can take control of your peanut field. So we'll go into a little bit more depth on those. So some of the, these are probably the top four diseases that we deal with here in Alachua County or in Northeast Florida. Um, as you go, you know, in different regions of the United States and the Southeast US, you're gonna find a different suite of diseases, but um, we could pretty much count on soybean rust coming into the picture every year. And you can see that in the top left-hand side of the screen. Um, it's called rust because it has this orange, brown, rusty color. And if you get enough of that fungus on that leaf, it'll just drop all its leaves and then it won't be creating those photosynthates, those sugars to send down to the peanut and you'll get really poor peanut production. If we go right down from that one, you see tomato spot or wilt virus. Um, this is another um, common and major problem with growing peanuts here in Florida. And unfortunately, there's really no good control method for tomato spotted wilt virus. It is carried from plant to plant via an insect, but putting out insecticide to control that insect has not been efficacious. Um, so pretty much what you have to do, if you see a plant in your field that has tomato spotted wilt virus, and, and you can see the, the very obvious symptoms, the circling, the concentric circles, and just the really odd growth, um, that, that's a very good indication of a viral infection. So you just got to rogue those plants out, get them out of the field and destroy them if you can, bury them or burn them, because you don't want that virus moving to other parts of your field that are uninfected. On the right side um, is um, more fungal diseases. And the top right corner is probably the, the number one thing that we're battling for peanuts here in the state is early and late leaf spot. It's caused by two different types of fungi. One comes on a little bit earlier in the season and then the other one comes on a little bit later in the season, early leaf spot, late fleet spot. Um, they can be controlled with fungicides and they are controlled very effectively with fungicides. Um, so if you're growing peanuts in Florida, you basically have to as soon as um, about a week before you start noticing these symptoms, um, you, you need to be out there with a fungicide. And um, we basically, we, we create a, a peanut prescription plan for you um, to where you're out there and you're putting on a fungicide. And if it's got a, a two week residual, then two weeks after that first application, you're out there with another fungicide. We basically have to, to keep them sprayed um, up until um, just a few few moments before harvest so that those leaves don't drop and we don't get all those nasty leaf spots. Finally, there's um, a disease out there called white mold, um, which is caused by a fungus, Sclerotinia rolfsii. And what you'll notice when you're looking out at the field is that there'll be some yellow plants or some stunted plants that just don't look very healthy. And if you go and you push the leaves aside and you look down at the base of that stem, you'll probably end up seeing like a white cottony growth. And that white cottony growth is actually fungal mycelium from the fungus sclerotinium. And if you were to slice that stem open, you would probably find little hard black pellets, almost looks like mouse poop, inside that stem. And that's called a sclerotium. And it's just a survival structure of that fungus. So it survives as that little hardened black mass, that sclerotium in the soil for a very long time. So unfortunately, rotating away from peanut doesn't work that well because you could go away from peanut for two years and then come back to that field to plant peanuts and those sclerotia will, will basically germinate and that fungus will be present again. So lots of disease issues with peanuts, but alas, we still grow really good peanuts here. So that's kind of cultivating the plant throughout the year. Now, what happens when we're getting ready to harvest these guys? So this is another thing, um, another service that Extension can provide um, is grading your peanuts. So Peanuts don't, um, they're not like corn, where corn flowers and it puts out its ear of corn all at once. You know when it happens, it's only one time and it's done. 
peanuts will, will, will create peanuts and keep making peanuts um, for, for a moment in time, you know, maybe several weeks. So there's going to be a time where you have a little bit of peanut formation, a lot of peanut formation, and then you're going to get to a point where some of the, the, the peanuts that were very first formed on that plant are going to detach from that peg. So when you pull the plant up, the peanuts are going to remain in the soil. So there's this peak that you want to target in order to harvest your peanuts to, to make sure you have the most peanuts on that plant. And, and, and when you pull it up, they're going to remain attached to that peg. So that's what this picture is showing is um, an extension agent grading peanuts. So we asked the grower to go out into their field and collect 200 peanuts from several different locations without, within the field. So 200 peanuts total, but you're taking it from plants throughout different locations in the field. And then we take those peanuts and we actually use a, um, a power washer to blast off the outer shell. And then as you can see in that picture, when that happens, some of the peanuts will be really white, some will be brownish, tannish brownish, and then they get almost black. So the black ones were the ones that were first formed. They're the oldest, the whitest, and the white ones have just recently formed. So um, there's, there's kind of some math and you use this little chart, you place the peanuts on there, and then depending on how many peanuts you have in each column, then it, it, it estimates how many days left until optimal harvest. So we wanna get that optimal harvest time out there so that we can ensure our greatest yield. So how do we harvest peanuts? Well, like I said, the peanut actually forms underground, which is crazy. So in order to harvest the peanuts, we have to dig them up and flip them upside down. So those peanuts are exposed to the air and the sunlight. And so that's what you're seeing here is a huge peanut digging machine, um, which is really fascinating to watch in person. Um, it comes along, scoops the plant up, turns it upside down, and then lays it gently back on the ground. Um, so it usually takes about three days of that plant laying there for it to dry down. When you put that plant into a storage bin, you want it to be at about 10% moisture or less. Anything more than that will create a great environment for fungal rot. And so you'll put your peanuts in storage and if it's greater than 10% moisture, they'll just rot on you. Um, so after they've laid there for three days and they're dry, um, basically you come along um, with a combine and that's what you're seeing in this picture. It, it, scoops up those dug up peanuts and it removes the peanut from the rest of the plant. And so all you're left with is the peanut in the shell and it spits the debris out of the back end. As you can see all the leaves and stems and everything else it didn't collect comes out the back end and it just co collects the peanuts in that bin. It's pretty cool to watch these machines work. So that's pretty much it in, in a nutshell. And so, you know, where do we sell our peanuts to? We sell them all over the place, but uh, we sell them for peanut butter, for candy peanuts, for roasted, for, for boiling, um, usually green peanuts that are harvested a little bit earlier in the season. Um, we can extract the peanut oil from peanuts. Uh, we can use the holes as cattle feed and there are other products. Um, but we'll let Martha kind of dive into how you can use them in your diet and the nutritional components of peanuts. So with that, I will hand it back over to Martha to take you on home. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I saw my favorite peanut brittle in there in that picture, and I didn't put that in here when we get to that, but I'm Martha Maddox. Uh, again, I'm your family and consumer science agent here in Alachua County, and I'm going to talk basically like I did with watermelon about some basic peanut facts, uh, safety tips, and how to use peanuts. And I'll have to admit, I was like Kevin. When my husband brought me down here to his home state, and we were talking about peanuts. I said, they grow underground. Well, he thought I was totally, you know, he just couldn't believe it. He took, you know, he's a Floridian and, and he's farmed for all these years. Took me over to his cousin's peanut farm. And I was so intrigued, Kevin, with, with seeing the peanuts, you know, growing underground and learning about them. And yes, if you have not seen peanuts harvested with one of those machines, that is a must. But anyway, let's talk about some peanut facts. <laughs> Keep in mind what I am mainly talking about when I talk about the nutritional value is the raw peanuts, the raw green peanuts. Uh, peanuts are a good source of protein, fiber, and they're a heart healthy fat. They are lagoons and they're members of the pea family. 
uh, lagoons can lower your cardiovascular risk by reducing your blood pressure and improving your glycemic control. Now keep in mind this is raw peanuts because the more you like add salt to these peanuts that is not good for reducing your blood pressure because sodium raises your blood pressure. They are a good source of manganese and they're important for healthy bones and muscles. And it takes about 540 peanuts to make that 12 ounce jar of peanut butter. So Kevin, you got to get out there and get the peanuts, you know, gathering them. Uh, I found this on the uh, National Peanut National Peanut Board uh, website, and I thought it was uh, very interesting about six reasons to choose peanuts. And I thought this uh, picture was was very appropriate for what we're talking about. Protein is the number one. Uh, reason. Because in the end, I'm going to talk about the my plate. And part of that is protein. And uh, peanuts have more protein than any nut out there. They are uh, the nutrients. They're a good source of vitamin E, magnesium, niacin, and copper. And they're an excellent source of manganese. The fiber is a good source that helps keep us full. So if we eat uh, peanuts as a snack in between meals, it's gonna help keep us uh, full. It's also gonna improve our blood cholesterol level. And that's eating in moderation. You don't wanna you know, overeat there. Uh, they're low carb. They're very low in sugar and carbohydrates and they support, again, the blood glucose control and they provide a sustained energy. So peanuts give us a lot of energy. They are bioactives such as uh, the resistols and they reduce the inflammation and the risk of certain cancers. And they are healthy fats like uh, Kevin was talking about when they extract uh, for peanut oil. It's, uh, the peanut oil is uh, healthy because it's high in mono and polyunsaturated fats that reduce blood cholesterol. Now, what is the nutritive value of a raw peanut? <clears throat> and I am going to tell you if you're buying uh, a salted peanut or a seasoned peanut or a honey glazed peanut, you need to look at the nutrition facts, the food label, and look at serving size. The serving size will tell you the amount of servings. And that is what the calories and all this information is based on. So a fourth of a cup, if it says a fourth of a cup of peanuts, a fourth of a cup of raw peanuts has 214 calories, 18 grams of fat, eight grams of carbohydrates, nine grams of protein, and two milligrams of sodium. So when we start adding sodium and seasonings, it will change the nutritive value of sodium and the other nutritive values of the peanuts. Now, when you go to shop for your peanuts, you want to buy raw peanuts in bulk and that will save you money. Well, where do you purchase raw peanuts in bulk? All store, at some stores, they carry it at your local farmer's market or at your uh, producers, your peanut producers. And this is during the peak harvest of peanut season. You should keep your, peen your raw peanuts in an airtight container in the refrigerator. Now let's talk about some cooking ideas. How are we going to cook these peanuts or what are we going to do with them? Well, you can roast peanuts and add to an addition to salads, stir fries, desserts. You can flavor your raw peanuts with spices like paprika, curry powder, cinnamon, Cajun seasoning, and also uh, different crushed peppers if you like that fiery, kicky spice taste. And you roast them or fry them. You can also flavor them with herbs such as garlic, rosemary, dill, chives, or you can use the different herbal oils and then roast them or fry them. Now, when I talk about oven roasted peanuts, I'm gonna preheat my oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to uh, bake unshelled peanuts for about 20 to 25 minutes or shelled peanuts 
for 15 to 20 minutes. And I'm gonna make sure I stir these during the cooking process. Now let's talk about some different ways that you can eat peanuts. Now, Kevin already talked about peanut brittle. And of course, everybody knows we have peanut butter. Well, our, our typical peanut butter and jelly sandwich that we all loved, how about grilling that? That's really good. This has become a delicacy to me and I had never had them. Kevin, did you ever have boiled peanuts before you come to Florida? Oh, no. I didn't either. And I, when Danny told me, uh, you want some boiled peanuts on our trip down? I said, you got to be joking me. Well, I fell in love with them. I uh, had to watch them though, because boiled peanuts are very, very high in sodium. Uh, because all it is, is raw peanuts, green peanuts, put in uh, water with salt, brought to a boil. <clears throat> and yes, the salt absorbs into the peanuts. Uh, this is a real good uh, favorite of mine, a peach salsa. You take peaches, onions, peppers, and peanuts and marinate it all together. A peanut sauce over noodles. Squash and peanut curry is very good. One of mine and my daughter's favorite is the Thai chicken peanut lettuce wraps. You take lettuce and uh, noodles, rice noodles and peanuts and carrots and chicken and wrap it up in lettuce and it's a delicious, delicious meal. At the holiday times, the, the simple peanut butter cookies with three ingredients can't be beat or my little granddaughter's favorite, the uh, peanut butter blossoms with the chocolates for the chocoholics. A good, soft, moist peanut butter cake. Anytime you want to, uh, to reduce the liquid in uh, a recipe, you can add peanut butter or applesauce and it will add moisture to a cake. Uh, also, peanut butter pie is, is very good. Uh, your spicy peanut chicken stir fry. Any of your stir fries that you use, you can add peanuts right at the end and uh, add some crunch to it. Or peanut soup. I was very reluctant to try peanut soup, but try it, you might like it. Now we've talked about watermelon and peanuts, but I wanna also go over and capture some of the other Alachua County ag commodities. And these are just a few, there's several more. You have your strawberries, your cucumbers, your squash, your green beans, your peppers, your eggplants, your cabbages, your tomatoes, your blueberries, onions, you know, all of these are local produce. Make sure when you're buying produce, try to support our local farmers, our local commodities. And these are the fresher products, shop local. And when you're planning your meals, go by the dietary guidelines of the My Plate. And that means half of your plates should be fruits and vegetables. So you're going to need to shop local to support those local farmers. Also, you want to have your dairy and you want to make sure that half of your plate are whole grains and you want to go lean with protein. And if you want to substitute your peanuts for your protein, you can because peanuts are proteins. We hope you have enjoyed our webinar today and that you support the Alachua County local ag producers. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez and Dr. Carlos and Dr. Sanders for joining us today on our webinar for Food Checkoff Week with Farm Bureau.